What do you think about when you think about human nature? It's really this kind of sense that uh, it describes the way people normally act or respond to certain circumstances and situations in life that's really consistent from one person to the next. You know, we, we get this sense of if something's going on, something's happening, we expect that we know how people will respond. It's human nature. And, uh, and, and we're shocked, really, when people respond in a way that we don't expect, when it doesn't seem to fit what we think is human nature, like what's going on. And, and that's really something that's you know, gone on, um, this, this sense of human nature and our expectations about how people respond. And, and really, if we even go back to uh, Adam in the garden and how he responded to God, when they had eaten from the fruit of the tree that they weren't supposed to, we see how human nature unfolds, don't we? What did they do? They sewed fig leaves together to hide their nakedness. They hid in the garden when they heard God moving through the garden. When God called out to them, where are you? Adam comes out of hiding and admits that he was hiding out of fear because he had done the wrong thing. And when God confronts Adam about his behavior, his response is to deflect the responsibility from himself to the woman you put here with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. It, it, it wasn't me, it was the woman. That doesn't really work very well even today, let's face it. And when God confronts Eve, she responds the exact same way, deflecting responsibility from her own behavior to the serpent, right? The serpent deceived me and I ate. And it's just human nature to try and deny and deflect and diminish the responsibility for our behavior when we know that we've done something wrong. Call it self-preservation or whatever you want. We see it in our own behavior and even see it in the youngest of our children. I remember coming home one day from work and our house had a garage door on the side of the house and you'd go through the garage and into the back door and hang up your coat and put down your briefcase and all that. That was how our house was set up. And our neighbor's house was, you know, 10, 12 feet away on the other side. And I came walking up and I happened to notice that the window in my neighbor's house opposite our doorway was broken. And I could tell it had been broken from the outside. That's the beauty of double pane windows, right? Usually you break the outside one, but the inside one stays intact. So you know that something has hit this window and it had to be hard. So, of course, I was wondering which one of my four boys had managed to break my neighbor's window. First thought went through my mind. And when I got inside, I began to explore this with my boys. And you can probably visualize the reaction I got. Four blank faces. Four verbal denials of, I have no idea what happened. I knew the truth was hidden somewhere behind one or more of those angelic faces that were looking at me. And I never got to the bottom of it. Until one day, my one son at the age of about 35 felt it was safe to confess. It was him that tried to hit the golf ball while he was between the houses and not out in the backyard, and had shanked it into our neighbor's window. That's just human nature, isn't it? We deny, we deflect, and diminish our responsibility for our actions when we're confronted with the truth. But when we're falsely accused, our response is even more vehement, and we will even call for witnesses to confirm our innocence. Your kids just don't stand there going, I have no idea. 
you get the, no, it wasn't me. It might have been him. It might have been, you know, the neighbor ran through the yard and broke. Like, you'll get all kinds. But when you're falsely accused, you're going to defend yourself. So when we look at Stephen's situation and how he responded to it, we're shocked, aren't we? Here's an innocent man. Here's a man who's humble enough to serve the needs of widows in the community, but also a powerful spokesperson for the Spirit of God who'd performed apostolic types of signs and wonders that it told us in Scripture. We definitely view him as the humble servant leader, like the one he follows, Jesus. I mean, his accusers are fellow Hellenistic, Aramaic-speaking Jews that share a similar language and culture. These were not cultural enemies who were speaking out against an outsider, but they were frustrated, it tells us, with their own inability to challenge the wisdom with which Stephen was speaking in the temple. So they had found people that would lie and bring false testimony against him. Witnesses that would speak out against the character and what he was saying. So we would think that Stephen's immediate response would be to defend himself, to just say no, to maybe bring witnesses against the false witnesses, people that would speak out against the character of his accusers and at least raise reasonable doubt in our modern terms as to the truth of what they were saying. But that is not what Stephen does. Shockingly, he responds in an entirely different way. When in the beginning of chapter 7, it says, Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these charges true? Are they true? And I'll ask you to bring up the scripture reading so we can read through his response. And we would expect that the first word out of Stephen's mouth would be simple. No. Are these charges true? No. And he might vehemently say so. But he responds in a completely unexpected manner. He says this, brothers and fathers, listen to me. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And after the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way. For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. God said, and afterward, they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, and Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. And later Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our ancestors could not find food. 
When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph went for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt where he and our ancestors died. It doesn't say they lived there. That's where they died. And their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. Interesting that the promise to Abraham, the only piece of land he ever owned and possessed was a tomb. As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Stephen begins his defense, if we want to call it that, by talking to his brothers and fathers, addressing them very respectfully. And so often in our courts or in any human conflict, the nature of the relationship between the accused and the accusers is adversarial. If you've been to court, you would know that. It's adversarial. If you watch any court dramas or films, you see that. It's adversarial. People tend to look at the other person as being different than us. And this happens at a personal level as well as at a, a global level between nations. We can't see the other person as being like us, as being part of our tribe, so to speak. And Stephen addressing the Sanhedrin as brothers and fathers breaks down this barrier and establishes the fact that they are on equal footing. They are part of the same tribe. They share the same history. They share the same family tree, so to speak. He further strengthens this bond when he begins by referring to Abraham as our father. Not your father, but our father, Abraham. And I expect that Stephen was trying to break down any barriers that might prevent the members of the Sanhedrin from hearing what he was about to say to them. Because what he goes on to say is not really any type of personal defense, like we would expect. But it's a systematic retelling of Israel's history and how God has worked through that history and ultimately how they failed to truly follow God. So over the course of the next few weeks, we'll, we'll see that Stephen addresses the three areas that form the foundation of Israel's faith and religious practices. Today we look and he's talking first of all about the promise, the promised land that they lived on. The second piece is the law that was given to Moses. And finally, the temple that was built by Solomon be the, to be the home of God in their midst. Now, Luke records all of Stephen's defense, and it's the, the longest message recorded in the book of Acts. It's longer than any of Peter's sermons or Paul's sermons or anyone else's sermons. This is the longest message that's recorded. So there must have been something important in this for Luke to capture it all for us to have recorded and to hear today. But when you read through this, it's, it's more like a, if you're old enough, you'll remember something called Cole's Notes, right? Cole's Notes were the, the high school student's best friend when I was growing up because you could either read all of a book by Shakespeare or you could read the Cole's Notes. And usually the Coles notes were enough to get you through the course and pass the grade or help you write a paper. 
And so what we're seeing here is this kind of Cole's Notes version of the story of Israel and God working with them. And they're very well-known stories, even for us, where people could fill in the blanks of what God had done and how he had acted. So let's start with Abraham. Now, they didn't have Ancestry.com to reach their family, research their family history. Uh, but all of Israel was aware of the family tree. Uh, oral traditions and stories had been passed down and then had been written in the Pentateuch. And it all led back to this man, Abraham. Their family history goes back to Abraham and the promise that God made to him when he called him to leave the country where he lived and go to a place where God would show him. And the Bible tells us that he didn't know where he was going, but he stepped out in faith. And although the promise of God was tied to the land and inheriting this land, it was so much more. We read this promise first in Genesis. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham does step out in faith to follow God's call, without knowing where he's going or how God was going to accomplish what he has promised. And although Stephen doesn't go into all the details as we journey through Abraham's story recorded in the book of Genesis, when we think back on it, we see a very flawed individual who really screws up time and time again and tries to do things in his own way in hopes of helping God fulfill his promise. When a famine hits and they have to leave the land to go to Egypt, Abram passes his wife Sarah off as his sister. Because she was beautiful, and he feared that the Egyptians might kill him so they could have her. So he passes her off as his sister. And when they're older and still do not have any children, they decide it would be best for Abraham to take a second wife and have children with her. And we know that that didn't really work out very well either. But God made a way for his promise to be fulfilled through the birth of Isaac. When Abraham returned to the promised land, he was still a squatter, not possessing the land. And God reaffirmed his promise to Abraham, and it is this promise that Stephen refers to. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land. Even though at that time, Abraham had no children. And God spoke to him in this way, for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. And they'll be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And God said, and afterward, they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. How do we tend to react to promises that don't have an immediate or very foreseeable fulfillment? How do you think your kids would respond to, oh, we're going to go to Disney World in 400 years? We, we're, we're not used to that, right? If we, someone promises, you know, you, your wife says, will you take out the garbage? Oh, I promise I'll take out the garbage. And then you get busy, you know, watching the hockey game and, you know, you forget. And then, you know, you, you realize that at seven in the morning when you hear the garbage truck coming through the street and you go, oh, I missed my promise. 
How do you think Abraham felt going, Lord, you promised something, but I'm not going to see it. We won't see this for 400 years. And yet he trusted God. Well, he eventually trusted God because after that promise, you know, his response when he was told that it would be through Sarah having a son in their old age, that it would be through this son, this son of promise, that God's promises would be fulfilled. Abraham laughs. Abraham laughs at God. How can you do this? Makes no sense. It's impossible. She's 90, I'm 100. I don't know if they had walkers in those days, but I'm sure they did have something like that. And, and Abraham even asked God to reconsider this and use the alternative of his making. He said, Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. In, in, in essence, what he was asking God to do was do it my way. I, you know, God, I figured this out for you. I've got a son now. I've got a great alternative to your original plan. Can't we do it my way? But God was faithful to his promise, and in the following year, Sarah gave birth to Isaac, the son of God's promise. And Abraham was faithful in what God commanded from him, and from that point forward, the circumcision of each male was a sign of the covenant that God had made with Abraham and Abraham had made with God. Stephen goes on to make a short reference to Isaac and Jacob, who then becomes the father of 12 sons. I had four, you know, but he had 12 sons who become the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel, the patriarchs, as Gord referred to them. And while there is all kinds of twists and turns to the story of Isaac and Jacob, God continues to work out his plan for redemption through them and despite them. Then the story shifts to Joseph. And I think Joseph is one of the most interesting characters in the Old Testament, maybe in all of Scripture. Stephen makes it all sound so simple and straightforward, doesn't he? Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph. They sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. And he gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And so Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Seems very linear, doesn't it, the way he describes it? Straightforward. Jealous brothers sell you, you end up a slave, things go well, all of a sudden you're the head of Egypt. But again, there's so many intriguing twists to the plot line that we could explore. A dysfunctional family on many levels. The dysfunctional fathering of Jacob, a father who shows favoritism to one of his sons over the others. A son that squeals to his father about the things his brothers were doing. A son that doesn't recognize or doesn't care about the impact his favored status has on his relationship with his brothers. Brothers that were at first willing to take his life, but then were still willing to sell their brother into slavery and go home and tell their father that he had been killed by an animal. I can imagine that as Joseph was traveling in that caravan down to Egypt and then got sold as a servant to Potiphar, he was probably pretty depressed, thinking that God had deserted him. He had gone from being the favored son in a wealthy family to being a slave in a foreign land with no hope 
of escaping and being reunited with his father and family. The lowest of lows. But then Stephen has this one phrase, this one sentence in there. But God was with him and rescued him. Rescued him from all his troubles. Now when we think of being rescued, we think of a a rescue mission with a a plan and a a hero that's going to lead people with resources that spring into action to rescue the person from the bad guys, right? How many movie plots have that as part of the plot in a movie that you've watched? All kinds of them, right? So when we think of Joseph's rescue... And the way it's described, you think, oh, this is, again, pretty linear, pretty quick. But it's not just his rescue from his initial troubles with his brother and being into slavery, but throughout the story, there's all kinds of additional troubles that poor Joseph faces. Uh, His rescue from all his troubles included additional troubles once he was in Egypt, as if he hadn't suffered enough. And every time it seemed as he was getting ahead, something else would happen to him and draw him back. He worked so well as Potiphar's servant that he was ultimately put in charge of his whole household, a position of trust. But Potiphar's wife destroys that trust, and he ends up in prison. But then in prison, the warden ends up putting him in charge of all the other inmates. Back to a level of trust within a prison. Then he interprets a dream for the cupbearer to the king, but the cupbearer forgot about him when he got reinstated to Pharaoh's court. A couple of years goes by, and finally he gets the opportunity to interpret a dream for Pharaoh and warns him about seven years of famine that will follow seven years of plenty. And he recommends a plan to him to collect a portion of the harvest from the years of plenty so there will be grain and food to keep people through the famine. And Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of implementing this plan, recognizing And these are Pharaoh's words. Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. (coughs) Excuse me. From the outhouse to the penthouse, with lots of ups and downs in between, and all by the age of 30. I I just blows my mind to think that at 30, so much could have happened in this young man's life. God's rescuing of Joseph from all his troubles taken years and has been a journey from the lowest depths of being falsely accused and imprisoned to the highest position in the nation of Egypt. And it is at least seven years later when the pieces of God's plan to fulfill his problem, promise to Abraham takes its next step in arranging the reuniting of Joseph with his father and brothers. This part of the story is that then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering and our ancestors could not find food. And when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. And on their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was. And then Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. And after this, Joseph sent for his father, Jacob, and the whole family, 75 in all. And then Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and our ancestors died. The the story of Joseph's interaction with his brothers is one of the most intriguing stories in the Bible that describes how God is at work in ways that we may find difficult to see. But Joseph was given the wisdom to see. 
In speaking to his brothers, he communicates to this, this to them very clearly. He said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. What a surprise that must have been for them, right? We, we thought he was gone. I'm your brother, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. It was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Now it was the brothers that put him in a cistern, took his nice coat, and sold him to the caravan to take to Egypt. That didn't change the history of it. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. And even after Jacob dies and the brothers are thinking, oh, he's just been nice to us now because his father's around and they get really kind of worried. They make up some story of what Jacob had said before he died about how he should treat them well still. His response to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So everything has come together for God's promise to Abraham to make a great nation out of his descendants. From 75 people of Jacob's family that went down to Egypt because of the famine, the pieces were in place for them to prosper and multiply into a nation of people. 400 years is mostly summarized by this one phrase. As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. It would take 400 years. And we would have hoped that things would go smoothly for Stephen, uh, go smoothly for them in that 400 years. Stephen leaves us with one little plot twist that changes everything and leads us into the story of Moses. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power. This story continues through us today. God is with us working in us and through us, despite what we do ourselves sometimes to try and accomplish his purposes. He is working. He has the power to fulfill his promises, to fulfill his purposes. And we have the privilege to serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and offer him our worship and praise. And we may be challenged at times to see how he is working, but we can be assured that he is. There's a poem that's really familiar to, I think, most of us here, but it came to me as I was thinking about how do you, how do you conclude this sermon for us? How do we see ourselves in this story that Stephen is sharing? And it's called Footprints in the Sand. And it's this, one night I dreamed a dream as I was walking along the beach with my Lord. Across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. And for each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. And after the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. And I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. 
I don't understand why. When I needed the most, when I needed you the most, you would leave me. And he whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you. Never ever during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. And that's the God who loves us. Jesus, who gave his life for us. I pray that you find comfort and strength on your journey. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we look back and consider the story of how you promised Abraham to make a great nation, promised him a land, promised to bless every nation, every people through him. Father, we just are so appreciative of these stories that demonstrate your faithfulness in so many times of trouble and trial and challenge. And knowing that in all of those, you are not a distant God. You are not one who turns his eye away, but stands there and embraces us and holds us in your precious arms. And so we thank you, Father, and pray that as we continue our journey, that we would be strengthened by knowing that you're present with us, that you are working out your plans, your purposes for redeeming our lives, but redeeming all of creation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.